Welcome back, everybody, to the DanJohnUniversity.com podcast. I'm Dan John, and welcome to episode 117. And as always, I really appreciate your questions, and it keeps us all going. Um, over there on the university, we've had a couple of nice discussions lately uh, on changing programs slightly, with small changes. Uh, for a couple of months, oh, that's a South San Francisco-ism for for a couple of months. Uh, for a couple of months, I have been doing a lots of snatches, Olympic snatches. And recently, I kind of discovered that, you know, just doing a simple change from I, I do this little back to back thing. It's kind of a kind of like a superset, but there's some space. But I do. A, I was doing front squats and then rest, squat, snatch, rest, front squat, squat, snatch. And uh, I was just fine. I was just beating my shoulders up. And so I just made this small decision to do squat clean, to overhead squat, to squat clean, to overhead squat. Now, for many of you listening, you're already like, I have no idea what in the world he's talking about. But basically, I'm saying this. Uh, there are lots and lots and lots of exercises uh, in my work. Uh, you can see it on my workshops. You can see it on some of my videos. Uh, I break everything down into push, pull, hinge, squat, loaded, carry. And then there's this movement matrix where we start with isometrics, uh, no movement, uh, the, the traditional strength movements, the anti-rotation movements in each of those families, and then the ballistics, and then the Olympic lifts. You know, and on my list, I, it, I cheat. I only have, there's a lot more, but I only use 37 exercises. But one of the things I think people miss sometimes is that sometimes you might have a really, really good program, but by simply swapping one exercise for another, just changing something, just that simple. Three sets of three is kind of what I do with the Olympic lifts uh, now. Uh, that would be the top end set. Uh, but three sets of three is great. But if three sets of three and the squat snatch is ripping my shoulders up because of all the other stuff I'm doing, uh, then, you know, go to the squat clean and miracle of miracles, my shoulders don't hurt. So I guess the key is this, is that sometimes, you know, relatively minor changes uh, are far better than, you know, just throwing everything out. Um, it's been the hardest lesson for me. You know, the Olympic lifts are good. Uh, the power lifts are good. Calisthenics are good. Traditional bodybuilding strength movements are good. Uh, everything, tumbling is good. Monkey bar climbing is good. Uh, um Everything's good. Uh, and it's sometimes it's just as simple as just pulling this out and doing this for a while is just will, will make you much happier. I've actually talked to people who they told me when they were young, they would do uh, a powerlifting meet. And then after the powerlifting meet, they would bodybuild for a while and then they would Olympic lift. And one of the things they always talk about um, is how how their joints actually felt good switching from one to the other. Now, everyone would say, oh, the Olympic lifts are the hardest on the joints. But, you know, in my case, I've always found uh, a lot of the things like pull-ups and things like that, more the traditional power bodybuilding movements, much harder on my joints than snatch and clean and jerk. Uh, for hypertrophy, you know, everyone wants to say that, you know, high rep squats, and I'm one of them, I agree, is the best way to put weight on. But in my career, when Dick Notmeyer just had me do heavy, heavy front squats, you know, triples, doubles, and singles. Uh, that's the most weight I ever put on in my life. And it comes back again, I think, to everything works. And that's that's got to be the cornerstone of what I teach, is that everything works. It just doesn't work forever. So minor changes can just really get you all fired up and excited to go back into the gym. I think that's the, the reason I like our forum there at the uh, Dan John University so much is that you get a lot of smart people, a lot of kind people who kick in with a lot of good ideas. So, uh, yeah, I think the workout generator is a, can be a game changer for many of you. I think the articles are fun. I think the, the, the books and the, uh, the downloads are fun and all that free stuff is fun. But, you know, you, you might miss something as obvious as uh, a forum when someone asks a question. So if you're a member, uh, a member, remember that you can always ask me here but you can always ask things on the forum. And I do my best to answer questions on the forum, but I've got to tell you, sometimes like uh, uh, it's hard for me to keep up with, and that's a good thing. Hey, let's begin with episode 117 of the DanJohnUniversity.com podcast and with a question from Jordan. And I already feel like as I went through today's questions, one or two of them uh, 
are a little bit outside of what I know, but let me just be a, a, someone who's kind and encouraging uh, for these questions. Jordan says, I'm 37-year-old male, 5'11", and have an eating disorder, a binge eating disorder, which uh, is interesting. Currently, I'm receiving treatment for it, uh, both a dietitian and therapy. Prior to getting treated, I ate a, a large calorie deficit for the uh, exercise energy I expended daily, kettlebell training only, and my weight was as low as 167, which I loved looks-wise. I have attached a picture to my email. But I was in and out of the hospital due to my binge eating, distended stomach, extreme heart palpitations, etc. Yeah, that's something I, I don't have any experience with, but I'm willing to help any way I can. Part of the treatment at the moment is to consume a lot of calories daily, mostly healthy and clean whole food, and to have one actual junk snack daily so I won't binge. It's working in that sense, but now I've gained over 30 pounds and my body does not even look toned at all, even though I'm working out. In your experience as a trainer, and personally as a man, do you believe abs and body image are important? Or do you think it's just how our society conditions us to be? Well, that's, that's the million, billion dollar question. Um, you know, I, I'm sure the first person to ever start etching on a, a cave wall was uh, probably thinking about, you know, certain curves or lack of curves or, you know, whatever. I, I, it's, it is something. Every so often online, Jordan, I'll read those kind of cool things about how body image has changed over time and how being absolutely pale and fat were considered the height of uh, celebrity not very long ago, you know, because any kind of tan means you worked outside and that's not what a, uh, a lady would do. Uh, um, yeah, I, I, th I think it is. I'll say this and uh, let me first explain some Art Devaney said. I don't know if Art Devaney is still with us or not. Uh, it's kind of hard to follow him because he appears and disappears online, but he said something in a podcast, the last one I, I heard him do, was he said that vanity is a pretty good thing after age 70 to work on. Because vanity, training to look good, would make you move good, well, and uh, do certain things like keep an eye on your diet, keep an eye on your sleep, keep an eye on your exercise. Uh, and, um, you know, just do the basics of what keeps you, you know, kind of going. I, I've never... I mean, I certainly have had abs in my life, uh, you know, when I was, when I was young and everyone just told me to get as big as I possibly could. And I just regret that now, Jordan, frankly. Um, you know, my best throwing was, uh, from 218 to 231. Oddly the way that I am now, except there's, there were some differences between what I look like in college and what I look like now. But, uh, you know, they, they told me at the, at this one place I needed to get up to, you know, 260, 270. And I did, and I felt and looked horrible. I could lift a lot of weight, but I felt terrible all the time. Getting back to your question. Um, I do like the fact that they have you eating a clean diet. I, I wish you could have been a little more specific on that. Cause I don't, cause when I read something like, uh, mostly healthy and clean whole food, what that might mean to you and your dietitian, and what that might mean to my ears, or maybe somebody in, uh, you know, North Africa or you know, I don't know, Ireland or even you know, Norway, Sweden, Germany. Clean food has a different uh, definition. One of the things I do love about the EU, and I'm shocked anyone would ever want to leave it, is that they have that very specific list of ingredients that they have in food. Uh, this is the ultimate of clean foods. As I understand it, if you irrigate grapes, you can't consider it an EU wine. It has to only be from the water that nature provides. Um, beer is only allowed to have four ingredients, as I understand it, to be an EU beer. And if they're that picky about beer and wine and other things, it's, it's, it's a good thing for everyone. Um, is it how society conditioned us? Well... I know this. I think of most of what you hear about body image comes from a lot of really weird people. That one idiotic model who looked at a victim of the Holocaust and said and commented on how good the person looked. I mean, I just, I just, it, it's so cringeworthy. And then that group of sisters down in Southern California whose dad uh, hid evidence in a very famous murder case. Uh, you know, they're on, they're all, they're all multi-billionaires, and they. You know, they, they, every, and 
they have all those photoshopped images because we know they're photoshopped because the doors in the back move. Uh, they've gotten better about that. But, you know, why are they defining how my daughter should look? You know, but it hits them. And then, you know, you just, all you got to do through do is go through some magazines from the 1980s, 1970s, and even more interesting, the 1960s, and look how looks have evolved in this country radically quickly and uh, in, in the United States. And I know that the United States influences many other cultures too. Uh, with men, I, you know, uh, I know that the six pack look got, you know, became very popular, but you know, it's interesting. And this isn't, um, not trying, meant to be strange, but I find very few women find that that, I mean, it's like, that's a look like, oh yeah, but it's not like a look like, yeah, I want to be around the 24 seven. So yeah, it's, it's a thing. Um, uh, I'm a, uh. I am amazed how body fat percentages keep going up and up and up. And we keep blaming things that the, we're not allowed to look at the fact that here in the United States, for example, that we're allowed, you know, we, we subsidize corn, soy, wheat, dairy, and one other thing uh, so much that it's in every single food you buy, every prepared food. You know, it is uh, something as simple as macaroni and cheese probably has more fat calories than, I mean, uh, to match whatever is in a mac and cheese serving, an actual serving, not that, that happened last night with, uh, with cheesecake, you know, uh, the, the, the thing on the box was interesting because, a, you know, a serving of cheesecake was just a reasonable amount of calories. And then you look at what a serving size was and you went, oh. Okay, so that a sliver of cheesecake is this much. A serving is a lot more. Yeah, Jordan, I, I don't know if I can help you specifically. I do think it's good that you're kettlebell training. Um, you know, with this binge day, and if it's good for you, uh, good for you. But I'd like to see some parameters put around even the binge day. Um, I, I don't know what else to do to help you. Um, body image has a value. You know, there is a value to it, you know. Um, you know, if, if you look in the mirror and you, you know, you, you feel good about the decision process you made, it's going to help your, your mind, your brain, lock down on that, those constant decisions that you're going to make. There was a very famous uh, Russian gymnast, Soviet gymnast years ago, when she retired, um, she famously said in her retirement, now I can finally eat. And um, I, I read somewhere a year later, and it was obvious. I mean, she just gorged herself after her career, which, which is not a healthy thing, you know? So to me, uh, I think we need to have a healthy relationship with the things we own, a healthy relationship with money, a healthy relationship with, you know, where you are in your age and your body. But it seems to me that, you know, I mean, I hate to blame the media. I always hate it when people blame the media, but the, the, the booming voice I get off of the television and the, uh, the, the internet is there is a way to look. And the hard thing is, I don't know, I don't know anybody who can look that way. You have to be in your late twenties, early thirties with, uh, millions of dollars and six pack abs. And that's really kind of hard to do for a lot of us. Jordan, I don't, I don't know if I helped or hurt, but, uh, I would like you to, if you, if you would mind, uh, would you mind emailing me? Uh, your, uh, what you call a, I like this, mostly healthy and clean whole food. Um, the mostly is something I'd like to know more about because mostly healthy is an interesting phrase and what clean whole food is. And I'll see if we can help you more from there. Thank you. We have a question from Grant. I am 50, 50 years old in November and living on the Isle of Wight, three miles off the South coast of England. And I'd love to visit you there. At the moment, I'm working from home. Approximately every hour, I take a break from my desk and do stretches in your Lifetime Warrior Workout PDF. Excellent. Uh, just type in, uh, gentle listener, uh, Dan John Lifetime Warrior, and I'm sure it'll come up. It's just a free little thing. I follow this with a 15-second hang from a pull-up bar and a 15-second deep squat and five push-ups and 15 kettlebell swings. This amounts, uh, the, uh, he does this between five and eight sets a day. Is this a good way of exercising? Okay, so that's his first question. I'm going to do my best to answer that, okay? Um, yes. 
it's interesting, Phil Maffetone's new book, which I always look over my shoulder. I think it's over in there in that stack of books now. It was right here in this stack, but uh, when I read books and I restack them, I don't always know where to put them. He recommends that, and I think what you're doing is fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. I mean, you're doing, holy cow, you're doing a lot. I mean, you're you're well over 100 swings a day, and there's a certain... I won't be surprised if downstream, years from now, researchers discover that this little dose of exercise that you're doing, like every hour on the hour, will be superior to going to the gym for the, an hour or whatever it is. Um, yeah, I'm a huge fan of it. I think there's great value. A lot of people cannot do it. I don't know why I don't. I'm thinking about it right now. I mean, right now in my gym, the weights are set, ready to go, all good. Um, don't know why I don't do it. Uh, except that I'm a lazy some son of a gun. It's an excellent idea, uh, Grant. Uh, uh, a great idea. I think you'll be very happy you do this. And then the second question, and if I'm allowed to have a second question, you mentioned in a previous podcast the brand of trainers that you wear with the wide toe box. I know you don't like repeating questions, but I've tried to find it and failed. Don't you worry. Um, let me see if I can, let me pull out one of the pairs. Don't go anywhere. things I do for my readers. Yeah, this is, so I have two pairs of these, this exact shoe, and then a pair of like brown dress shoes, and then a blue pair of trainers that I actually wore today. And they are called Witten, W-H-I-T-I-N. And it doesn't look that different, but uh, you'll notice very quickly that the toe box is much uh, much broader than normal. Uh, they're fairly flat shoe. Um, I can train in them okay. Um, I, I, they're great for walking. They're great for hanging around. And they're really inexpensive. And remind, reminder for gentle listeners, I don't make a nickel ever. Uh, I don't, uh, I don't, whenever I recommend a product, I don't get any money from it. Okay. Because, uh, I don't know, because I'm an idiot, I guess. Eh, I've tried affiliate sales. Uh, this is off topic, but I've tried those affiliate sales. And basically, I make a lot of money for the corporation. And they send me, uh, well, um, for my grant, my English friend, they send me pence back or hay penny back. All right. Thank you. Good questions. And glad I could answer them so easily. Got a question from Muhammad. I wanted to know your, what your opinion on pulling the floor, the bar off the floor, sorry, with the hip bones high versus low while performing a snatch or clean. Does it depend on the lifter's bone structure? Uh, okay, and he's got levers, muscles. Yeah, actually, one of the things I picked up, and I, I'm sure I'm not the first person to notice it. In fact, I know that Dick Notmeyer and Jim Schmitz used to talk about certain lifters, but it's the the shank. It's the, you know, the, the, the bones between your knees and heels that I think determine where the hips are going to be. You know, if you have really short shank, uh, whatever, foreleg, whatever the lower leg, if you have a really, really, really short one, uh, you probably could have your hips way up there and do all these marvelous things. You know, when you work with the guys like I have in the NBA, the National Basketball Association, or seven foot, you know, they're this, they're this much taller than me. You know, uh, <laughs> wow. I mean, for them to put their hands on the bar on the floor, uh, it was I didn't pick it up as quickly as I should have, but they're the ones where I first figured out every snatch and clean should be from the high, from high boxes, because when you put the weights up on boxes for those guys, it gave them a normal starting position. Because um, I noticed it the first time I was up in Portland, Portland, Oregon, and I'm sitting in a restaurant and uh, I look over. And there's a professional basketball team eating at the restaurant. And I looked over and they all sit in chairs funny. And I realized they sit in chairs funny because uh, one of them was Ralph Sampson. He was a, a very famous basketball player. And his, I mean, the distance between his heel and his knee, I mean, you could fit, a, a normal person uh, could stand next to it and take a picture. He was just so long there. So yeah, you'd have to train someone like different, uh, like that different. Is the answer the same for the power versions of Lift 2? Yes. Any wisdom, tips, and advice would be immensely helpful. 
Well, the only thing, Muhammad, if you are over five foot six, if you're over this tall, you'll probably find that the Olympic bar is too low to the ground for uh, most people's uh, hinge. Uh, that's why in the post-deployment program, uh, I recommend uh, rack deadlifts only. And when people first start doing the rack deadlifts only program, they're like, I don't get it. And they'll say things like, these are too easy. And it's like, well, they're not. Yeah, we are, yeah okay, they are easy because they're light and the reps are high. But th the other reason they're easy is because you're moving uh, the weights in a very favorable position. So I don't know how tall you are, but you might want to consider more lifts from the hang or from boxes. Um, or, and if you're shorter, uh, you're lucky to be an Olympic lifter. Um, so hope that helps. Thanks. We have a question from Connor with one N. Question about figuring out imbalances between legs. Uh, you got to be careful on this one. So asterisk before we start. I find I don't have the same connection with my right glute. I find I struggle with calf raises more on my right leg too. You know, there is actually a syndrome. Uh, women get it for sure. Where, but it's, it's, I think it's called Follett's syndrome. And if I said it wrong or spelled it wrong, well, tough for all of you. Um, but uh, it, it's first noticeable. Um, a woman will be very right-handed and, and to the point that her uh, she might be a C cup on the right side and an A cup on the other and always emphasize the left. And, and it's a condition where the left side is uh, uh, weaker. And it's a... It's a genetic thing, and there's not a lot you can do about it. You can balance some things out, obviously. But I don't know if any conditions on the, on the legs. Do you have any suggestions for diagnostic tests to help figure out where the weakness is in particular along that chain? Whether it is a weakness or lacks of flexibility somewhere. Been doing more single leg exercises like pistol squats and single leg glute bridges. I hurt, ah, no. I hurt my left glute lower back area around two years ago doing sumo deadlifts, which I felt may suggest something was getting over or under work, but I don't have the knowledge to diagnose. No injuries or niggles anymore, and I've been training at home with kettlebells these past few months, swings, get-ups, and goblet squats. You know, Connor, this is uh, here in the States, and if you're in the States, we call them uh, physical therapists. Uh, in, in Europe, they're called physios. It might be worth going to a physio. Uh, Dr. Gibbs, I had been told that I had an imbalance in my legs and I was wearing a, um, a lift. And then Dr. Gibbs, <laughs> he did something interesting. He took an x-ray and he said, nope, you don't need a lift. Your legs are perfectly this symmetrical. He goes, whatever you're feeling is something you're feeling. It's different. So I thought I had an actual imbalance in the length of my legs, but in truth, um, I didn't. And so I was wearing a lift, which God only knows what damage it did to my knees or hips or whatever. But uh, when you go to a good physical therapist, they might be able to walk you through and point it out. And they're going to test your mobility in, in, in certain places, like your feet and hips. They'll test some flexibility, like when your hand, basic stuff, probably like your hamstrings. Uh, they'll test test basic things in your legs, like you know, you're, uh, some of them are almost like uh, the old reflex test where the doctor hits the hammer on the knee and it pops. I mean, some of them are just about that level of stress for you. But it's interesting because when they do do those simple, where they, you know, they put their hand on top of it, like your knee and you're supposed to pull it up. And uh, when they see those gross imbalances, that leads them into um, a little bit of logic. Um, Connor, I've had a lot of people tell me about, you know, I don't feel this and I don't feel that. And very often it has uh, nothing to do with the injury you had in the past or what you think it is. And the, actually, the, so this is where the pain or the problem is, but the real problems are usually on the other ends. We talk about that a lot with the uh, middle age pull up syndrome, with the elbow injury. Very often has nothing to do with the actual elbow and the pull up. It has to do with broken shoulders. So if your shoulders are kind of racked up, you're putting that elbow out in a place that it shouldn't be, and then that makes it hurt. So I'm going to tell you, Connor, to go go see a, a, a good uh, a good PT or therapist and uh, uh, take care of business as best you can. It'll be worth your time. It'll be worth your energy. All right.
Thank you. Well, let's see. We got a question from um, Rick. Has your thinking changed, evolved over the years on Planks as a program? Uh, planks is a program. That's where you do push-up position planks. Uh, now we have people do uh, suspension trainer, TYs and I's, goblet squats, uh, glute bridge, and suitcase carries. Yeah, well, well, yeah, I guess I did. Yeah, we got, well, if you read the original, it says bat wings, and now we say suspension trainer, T's, Y's, and I's. Uh, the glute bridge is the glute bridge. Uh, the suitcase carry more than the farmer walk for most people because most people need to learn uh, to control that more than they need the load of a farmer walk. Though the load of the farmer walk does some wonderful things too, but no, not really. I mean, I guess it's always evolving. I, I don't use that program very much because I don't work with a lot of, um, uh, I don't work with that, those kind of clients anymore. I, I mean, I say that and by the time you hear it, I, I have 10 or so, but it just, no, not really. Also, do you have any advice about getting a reluctant sibling to work out with you? Uh, no. I, you know, Rick, and I appreciate it. Uh, I get this question even at workshops about my mom really needs to train, really needs to exercise. The doctor has been adamant and she won't do it. What can I do? You know, uh, John Powell, the great discus thrower, in a text uh, just within the last week or so said to me, all motivation is self-motivation. I thought that's a that's a pretty accurate little comment. I I, I don't know what to do. Um, I know that uh, I know that I know it takes most people some kind of real life uh, life changing event to to turn it around. And I just don't know. I don't know what's going to take to turn your sibling around. I just don't know. Um, a lot of people I know have really cut back on their alcohol uh, recently because of uh, um, an event here in my in my universe in, involving the abuse of alcohol. And it's once you see something, you suddenly go, "Whoa! It's this is real. This is tough stuff." So, sadly, to get someone like me to cut back my alcohol, I needed a you know I needed something. It's sadly in somebody else's life, but they had to see something painful. Um, most people don't, most people need, you know, you're going to die unless you get your cholesterol down or something like that before they do anything about it. Um, unfortunately, uh, I have, I started training with weights as a young person. So it's just a habit for me. Getting the, the sibling to get the habit is going to be a tough one. And I don't know how to do it. Like I say, I hope it helps, but that wasn't very helpful. Thank you. We have a question from Brandon. I hesitate to ask this question because the answer is most likely do what feels right. And I can't imagine me saying like this, something like that. More lifts are built around your stance and the width is shoulder width or slightly wider than shoulder or another variation. But if I wanted to be consistent and mark spots in the floor, how do I measure my shoulder width? Is it outside to outside or middle to middle? Well, yeah, I don't think, I've never used shoulder width. Yeah, I guess you say, I guess you say shoulder width because it's just such a, people will look down and do that, I guess. Yeah, I guess in football, when we talk about the hit position, we, we do that. Uh, I always tell people that your heels should be under your hips. Um, that's that's what I use. Um, and, it, and, it, and it's pretty, but your heels, and that I don't care, but... So it's your heels, that's your heels straight ahead. But when you squat, you might want your heels, all, you might even want your heels to here, your toes to here. And when you do more hingy kind of things, those toes are going to come in. Some even argue straight. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't disagree with the straight. Uh, I mean, a little hint I use for people uh, in the squat, you're, you're driving your knees out. You know, you want to squat between your legs. That's what the goblet squat is for. That's why banded squats work so well. That's why bear hug carry squats work so well. Uh, if you're doing hinges, if you have your heels and feet straight and you squeeze. So it's like uh, if you're standing on a, 
Oh yeah, like on a blanket. If you're standing on a blanket, you're mentally trying to squeeze the blanket into a into a blanket pile. You know, instead of being flat, you're trying to squeeze it. And so you're trying to do this with your heels. Try to hinge, actively squeeze those feet together and hinge, and you'll figure out a perfect hinge. Um, so that's Brandon. That's how I do it. Um, yeah, and 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 what I what you might want to do. I wouldn't necessarily put anything that's too permanent yet. Um, I like where your head's at, though. But why don't you experiment around for, I would say, at least, oh, you're going to have to go for a couple of weeks anyway. But try, you know, try putting these red dots or whatever you got on the floor. So red dot and red dot are uh, magic X. And put them there, there and then do a series of exercises. I would recommend, if you can, a uh, goblet squat and overhead squat. Uh, that's going to be tough. You know, if you're overhead squatting and you have to look down to find those dots, that's going to be tough. But just get a sense of where you get cramped up. Or I always notice when I have my feet in the wrong place, I feel like I'm getting in my own way as I squat. Like I, I, I feel like my, I need more room, so I have to move the, I move the, the feet out, which gives my knee more room, which gives my hip more room. Let's lets me sit down in it. So I don't know. Um, it, it's kind of a fun question, and I hope that helped. Oh, we have a question from Josh. Josh says, I'm starting to gear up for my 10K challenge in December. I'm guessing the 10,000 kettlebell swing challenge in December and wanted to ask, when doing a, a more intense program or a challenge like the 10K, if you're feeling pretty tired on a given day, is it better to skip the workout or lower the weight? Hmm. As someone who would never do either, it's a tough question. Yeah, I, I on something like this, the the challenge, I don't feel like doing it. The nice thing for me on the ten thousand kettlebell swing challenge, I don't want to do it on day one, and I don't want to do it on day twenty or nineteen. Actually, I guess statistically, uh, correctly, um, because it's inclusive. Uh, let's see what you got here. Uh, I do the challenge with twenty four k. And I try to stick with the 50, 25, 15, 10 rep scheme. But, okay, so, yeah, we got rid of that almost when the article got published. Uh, why don't you read up uh, on some of the other variations that I've come up with? Um, just type in my name, and I'm sure you'll get a, well, now a million variations and things so popular. But there are days when it's just not an option, even with the three days on, one day off. Rather than taking a day off, is it better to do the workout with the 20 or 16K? Or is it better to just rest until you feel good again? Um, just asking this question really helped me understand the magic of easy strength, by the way. That's a, well, thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, if you're feeling crappy, um, you know, <laughs> well, there's so many ways to do it. Uh, we have the one variation where you put, you put the 40, so you have a 40, uh, a 24, a uh, 24, a 20 and I guess like a 16 and you go you do the 40k for 10 you do the 24 for 15 you do that 20 for 25 and you do the 16 for uh, the 50 uh, there's another very uh, my favorite variation is when you do a set of 15 a set of 35 set of 15 set of 35 uh, the last time I went through it I think uh, yeah shoot my journals in the other room I'm sorry but I ultimately decided to just do, I just did up to, up to's, and I think that's what you should do, Josh. So up to is maybe the first set, you get 11, and then you just, so then you put a weight down, you rest, you get your drink of water. Then you start with 12, and if you get up to 30, great, you got the 30. And if you got the 31, great, doesn't matter. And you just keep tallying the numbers up. The last time I did it was in January of this year, and the best workouts I, I would say the bulk of the workouts I did were the up to method, where you know, and I was on live. Uh, you can see them all on uh, uh, YouTube. I have all twenty workouts on YouTube. Um, so uh, the up to challenge is the best part. Uh, I like it. Uh, so you just you just do when you're when. So you just do reps up until you start to get tired or the reps look lousy and then you stop and you move on. I, I love that method and I think you'll like it a lot. Well, thank you, Josh. I hope that helps and we will talk soon. 
Well, there you go, folks. Episode 117 of the DanJohnUniversity.com podcast. Remember, if you have questions, send them to podcast at DanJohnUniversity.com and I'll do my best to answer each and every one. Um, I've always enjoyed these podcasts and until next time, keep on lifting and learning for me, okay? Thank you.